This lesson examines from a high level the experience of black people with the Catholic Church in the United States. During slavery, Catholics, religious included, owned enslaved people. According to Father Joel Panzer in his book, The Popes and Slavery, no American Catholic bishop spoke for the abolition of slavery in the pre-war years. In 1840, Bishop John England explained to President Van Buren's Secretary of State, John Forsyth, that Pope Gregory XVI had condemned the trade in slaves, but that no pope had ever condemned domestic slavery as it had existed in the United States. Bishop England was wrong on both counts. As Panzer explains in his book, Popes and Slavery, several popes condemned slavery outright, as had Pope Gregory XVI in his 1839 bull, In Supremo Apostolatus. It was just that laity and clergy alike ignored those pronouncements. Here are a few of the recorded examples of Catholic religious owning enslaved persons. According to the Jesuit Plantation Project, Father William Hunter in 1717 recorded all the property owned on a Jesuit farm in Newtown, Maryland. He feared Protestants would seize everything due to rising anti-Catholic sentiment and activities in the colony. The inventory is the first known archive that identified the individual enslaved persons Jesuits owned. There were a total of 15 Negro servants, four men, Will, Jack, Kit, Pete, and four women, Mary, Teresa, Claire, Peggy, four boys, Jack, Clem, Tom, James, and three girls, Betty, Kate, and Susan. Father Hunter had everything in place to deed this property, human persons, to a local layman. He never did because the circumstances he feared did not materialize. According to Rachel Swarns in the New York Times article, The Nuns Who Bought and Sold Human Beings, Mother Agnes Brent, superior of the Georgetown Visitation Sisters, in 1821, sold many of their 107 slaves to finance various projects and to meet other financial obligations. Mother Agnes wrote of the approval and sale of an enslaved woman on the cusp of giving birth, along with her mate and their two young children, using these words. Nothing else to do than to dispose of the family of Negroes. The sisters were not unique in owning enslaved persons, as nearly all Catholic orders for women established by the late 1820s owned slaves, according to historians. Meanwhile, on July 2, 1829, servant of God Mary Lang founded the Oblate Sisters of Providence. She and three other women professed vows and became the first congregation of African-American women religious in the history of the Catholic Church. They served the black community by educating youth, housing orphans, and by taking care of those suffering in the midst of a cholera epidemic. A later archbishop attempted to suppress their order, but they found support from St. John Neumann, then Archbishop of Philadelphia and the Redemptorist Order. I personally benefited from Servant of God Mary Lang's order because my first grade teacher, Sister Mary of Mercy, was an Oblate Sister of Providence. She was the first religious sister I ever met, and she wore a habit. I had no idea that Black religious sisters were a rarity, relatively speaking. She was a wonderful teacher. Approximately two decades after the founding of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Venerable Henriette de Lille and Juliette Gaudin founded the second religious order for black women. Since their founding in 1842, the Sisters of the Holy Family in New Orleans work among the poor black people to educate them and care for the sick. In 1830, one year after the Oblate Sisters of Providence were founded, the first child of Michael Morris Healy, a white man, and his slave, Mary Eliza Clark, was born in Georgia. Some historians refer to Mary Eliza as Healy's common-law wife. 
Michael and Mary Eliza went on to have 10 children. Their father sent the children north for education and greater freedom since, by law, they were considered slaves in Georgia. The lives of their sons, James, Patrick, and Alexander, underscore how the prevailing racial attitudes of the day impacted the church and vocations. James, Patrick, and Alexander become the first black priests in the United States. However, according to Benedictine father Cyprian Davis in his book, The History of Black Catholics in the United States, they did not publicly speak out on behalf of black people, and Patrick actively shielded his heritage for most of his career. In lesson two, I pointed out that colonial legislatures as early as the 1650s made laws that codified anyone with a trace of black blood to less than human status. Being quiet about their heritage may have been to their advantage. Patrick became president of Georgetown University in 1874. It is ironic that Georgetown, built by enslaved black persons and financed its operations by selling enslaved black persons, unknowingly had a formerly enslaved black man as its president. All the while, the university did not admit any black students until the mid-1900s. In 1875, Patrick's brother, James, was ordained the Bishop of Portland, Maine. The Healy brothers understood the church was no shield against the prevailing racist attitudes of secular society and were not forthcoming about their black heritage. Blackness being a barrier or problem for religious life was not unique to the priesthood. According to the Global Sisters Report, a foundress of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Teresa Maxis Duchemin, formed the Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary congregations in Pennsylvania and Michigan after she left the Oblates. The community she founded knew she had black heritage, but purposely kept that fact a secret for more than 160 years. They were able to do this because Teresa looked white. The leadership in the communities, according to letters the sisters wrote, found it embarrassing and unpleasant to be affiliated with a black woman because, in their words, it would scare white people away from their ministries. Fully cognizant of the racist attitudes of the day and apparently harboring those attitudes themselves, the community, which had been founded by a black woman, attempted to erase her from its history. It was not until the 1980s that the community began to teach novices about their black foundress. Sister Margaret Gannon, a historian and sister of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, shared evidence of the efforts to conceal the truth about their foundress by publishing community letters in 1992 about Duchemin. An article for the Global Sisters Report states, there in black and white were more than 50 years of Immaculate Heart of Mary leadership explicitly forbidding historians from including Duchemin's background in their works. At one point, they even enlisted a cardinal to intervene in the publication of a book that might have outed them as having been co-founded by a black woman. Earlier, I gave a few examples of individual Catholics owning slaves. However, there are many examples of religious orders owning slaves like the Vincentians and the Sulpicians. According to James Fitz in his article, U.S. Catholic Religious and Slavery, A Seldom Told Story, published in Review for Religious, he says, of the first eight permanent communities of women religious founded within the original boundaries of the United States, six had slaves. Three in Maryland, the Carmelites of Port Tobacco, the Visitation Sisters of Georgetown, the Sisters of Charity in Emmitsburg, and three in Kentucky, the Sisters of Laredo, the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, and the Dominican Sisters of St. Catherine. Of the first eight congregations, the Oblate Sisters of Divine Providence, an order of African-American religious in Baltimore, and the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy in Charleston, South Carolina, were the two congregations that did not have slaves. In the antebellum South, bishops, priests, religious, and lay people owned slaves too. 
How did their witness shape Catholicism in America? How did their participation in white supremacy infect the church in the United States? How did racism, either through active participation or silent acceptance, limit the witness of the church? Meanwhile, Black people were forming organizations or joining organizations formed for them to create community for themselves within the church and to evangelize and serve the wider Black community. In 1886, Daniel Rudd, a leader among the Black laity, took up the cause of evangelizing other Blacks. He believed what the church teaches and believed the church was a place of hope and refuge for Black people. Rudd is a founder of the National Black Catholic Congress and recruited delegates to the first convening of the Congress. Rudd believed the Congress would be a place for Black people to discuss their perspective on questions affecting their race. Under their own agency, Black Catholics would decide a course of action to raise up their people, not only before the eyes of God, but before men. And Rudd assumed behind this course of action would stand the majestic Catholic Church of Christ. One of the reasons Daniel Rudd wanted a national meeting of Black Catholics was racial esteem. He says, we had watched for years the tendency on the part of some people to ignore the Negro as a man and a citizen in the United States. We thought that if we would turn the attention of our people to the moral truths taught by Holy Mother Church, our Lord would lift us from oppression, doubt, ignorance. At the first Congress in 1889, delegates advocated temperance, sought inclusion of Black people in labor unions, and employment of Black people without discrimination. They pledged to help establish Catholic schools and identified the need for trade schools and literary societies, just to name a few of the areas where they said change must occur. Rudd himself wanted Black people to be recognized as a part of the whole church. By the fourth Black Catholic Congress in 1893, Charles Butler, a prominent Black Catholic, in a speech to attendees regarding prejudice in the church, says, according to Father Cyprian Davis, I cannot dismiss this consideration without saying a word to those who would carry their prejudices into the sacred confines of God's holy church and relegate the Negro to an obscure corner of the church. How long, O oh Lord, are we to endure this hardship in the house of our friends? The Congress calls attention to the church's failure in its mission to raise up the downtrodden and to rebuke the proud. Although there were councils regarding the conversion of black people, Davis concludes the history of the Catholic Church's efforts to evangelize the black people in the United States in the period following the Civil War is not a very glorious one. While bishops refused or failed to provide clergy to the black community, a missionary religious society in England, the Mill Hill Fathers, came to do missionary work among the community in 1871. The Mill Hill Fathers came to the United States because they petitioned the Holy Father for a mission field, and the Holy Father assigned them the United States. During an 1875 visit to the U.S., the superior of the Mill Hill Society, Canon Peter Benoit, experienced the U.S. hierarchy's opposition to the evangelization of the Black community. According to Father Davis, opposition was rarely openly expressed, but was usually couched in terms of the uselessness of evangelizing the African American. An example of such opposition is documented in a letter Benoit wrote regarding James Bailey, the Archbishop of Baltimore. Benoit noted in his diary that Bailey had but little hope of any substantial good being done among the Negroes in America, that you had to cut the head off first of those whom you wished to instruct, that the antipathy was ineradicable. The Mill Hill Fathers trained missionaries in England to return to the U.S. to serve the Black community. These missionaries signed the Negro Oath promulgated by Pope Pius IX, 
According to the Society of St. Joseph of the Sacred Heart, the oath read that the missionary does vow and solemnly declare that I will make myself the father and servant of the Negroes, nor shall I ever take up any other work which might cause me to abandon or in any way neglect the special care of the Negroes. So help me God and these his holy gospels. This oath shaped the Society of the Sacred Heart of St. Joseph, the Josephites, which arose out of the Mill Hill Society in 1893. In 1909, the Josephites, in order that ministers to the black community, established the Knights of Peter Claver. The Knights of Peter Claver includes the Ladies Auxiliary, the Junior Knights, and Daughters of the Knights of Peter Claver. This inclusion of women and children makes them a family organization. The organization's website articulates their purpose. Our purpose is to render service to God and his holy church, render aid and assistance to the sick and disabled, and promote social and intellectual association among our members. Another congregation came to the United States in 1872 to serve the black community, the Congregation of the Holy Ghost. They are also known as the Spiritans. And in 1878, they began their ministry to black people in Arkansas. When I became a Catholic in South Carolina, the priest who accepted me into the Catholic Church on behalf of the Bishop of Charleston was a Holy Ghost Father, Father Egbert Figaro. Another interesting development in Black Catholic life arose during the First World War. During this period, assistance was provided to servicemen by race and religion. Among Catholics, the Knights of Columbus which was all white at the time, cared for white Catholic soldiers. Since black Catholic soldiers were left unaided, a prominent black Catholic, Thomas Wyatt Turner, along with a small group of laymen, met with Cardinal Gibbons to secure aid. With a referral from Gibbons, the National Catholic War Council responded to the concerns of Turner and his group by meeting the needs of black Catholic soldiers. Out of the meeting of Turner and fellow black laymen to remedy this plight of black servicemen arose the Federated Colored Catholics, which focused on racial justice. After World War I, black servicemen returned home empowered by their experience and yet still reviled by white citizens. Additionally, there was an increase in political power and wealth experienced by black people during the Great Migration to the North and a rise in wealth among some Southern Blacks producing cotton. According to Cameron McWhorter, author of Red Summer, the Summer of 1919, and The Awakening of Black America, these circumstances created an environment where white people became jealous and fearful of Black people's increasing power and prosperity. Red Summer is a term originated by James Weldon Johnson, the first field secretary of the NAACP to describe the bloodshed during the race massacres in 1919. Weldon is also the author of the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which has been called the Black National Anthem. The violence was so terrible during Red Summer that Cardinal Gaspari, then Secretary of State to Pope Benedict XV, sent a cable to the secretary at the apostolic delegation, one Monsignor Cossio. According to Father Cyprian Davis, Gaspari directed Cossio to urge the U.S. hierarchy at the next meeting to address the problems of the black population and to denounce the recent killings. Cossio wrote to then Archbishop Mundelein of Chicago, asking him to introduce the subject himself at the upcoming meeting of the bishops and noted that the violence was of great concern to the Holy See. While there were race massacres across the country from May to November in 1919, some of the worst happened in Mundelein's diocese. There were 13 days of increasing violence in Chicago, despite the presence of the state militia, and the dead totaled 38 people, 23 blacks and 15 whites, 537 people were injured and 1,000 black families were made homeless. 
A representative from the Apostolic Delegation also visited Cardinal James Gibbons of Baltimore to persuade him of the urgency of the matter and the importance the Holy See placed on the Black people, their needs, their grievances, their dying, etc. Gibbons gave assurances that the matter would be discussed in a special committee meeting. However, the archive of letters from Gaspari, the Secretary of State, to the Holy Father revealed that the U.S. bishops at their meeting, despite all interventions, did not address the issue of Black people dying in the streets. Black people were being beaten and killed in the streets and the bishops were silent. What exactly was happening during Red Summer? According to Smithsonian Magazine, lynchings and indiscriminate killings sparked 25 conflicts in small towns like Millen, Georgia, and in major cities such as Charleston, South Carolina, Chicago, Illinois, and Cleveland, Ohio. Elaine, Arkansas saw the most horrifying of all when 237 black sharecroppers were murdered over two days for trying to form a union. It was a year that would see 78 lynchings and 11 black men burned alive at the stake. The Charleston Chronicle in a 2018 article on the riot in their city reports, the Charleston News and Caria of May 11, 1919, reported that the rioting sailors went up King Street, randomly attacking black residents, dragging them off of street cars and beating them in the streets. Two local black men, Isaac Doctor and William Brown, were known to have been shot to death by the sailors and W.G. Ferdy, an African-American who owned a barbershop on 305 King Street, had his shop destroyed by the growing mob. The article goes on to quote the words of Septima Clark, a famous civil rights activist who witnessed the riot as a young woman. In 1981, she detailed her recollections to a reporter. We had trolley cars then. And these sailors got on and started beating every black they could find. They killed one or two of them. That Sunday night, nobody could go out. You had to stay in. The Citadel Square was filled with screaming and hollering, and we ran back into the house. Septima Clark was the sister of Mr. Peter Poinsett. He was a member of Centenary Methodist Church, my home church before I converted to Catholicism. As a little girl, I remember Mr. Poinsett playing the violin during the Methodist church services. These events of Red Summer may seem long ago, but they happened during the lifetime of people I know. And the terror of those events was easily recalled by survivors like Septima Clark. A year after Red Summer in 1920, with Pope Benedict XV's blessing, the Society of the Divine Word opened the first seminary for black men in Mississippi. Even so, some bishops were still not sure or supportive of black men becoming priests. Yet, despite all of the proceeding, black Catholics wanted to belong and be cared for within the church. Their firm belief in the faith kept them in the church despite the influence of racism within the church. In the next lesson, we will continue to examine the Black Catholic experience. We will review the bishop's first pastoral letter on discrimination and examine a searing testimony from a Black Catholic priest on what life was like for him inside the church. We will also look at the situation for Black lay people and the response to the first publicly recognized Black Catholic bishop. Finally, we will discuss the issue of integration as it relates to the church.